Well, hey, friends, welcome to the Vintage Truth Podcast. Uh, thanks so much for watching today or for listening. If you're listening to this on some audio device, maybe in your car, something like that. I'm so grateful for all of you uh, that faithfully listen and watch th this program. You know, one of the things that we're doing here is we're building something. We're doing something over time uh, that because we believe that Christianity and discipleship uh, is not something that you can do through microwaving yourself into maturity or through driving through and getting discipleship uh, in the drive through, but it's something that we build upon week by week by week. And uh, so this uh, the study we've been doing in the book of Ephesians certainly uh, contributes to that. You know, we've got some 475 different episodes uh, on the Vintage Truth podcast. You can go back uh, about around half or a little more than half uh, is, on, is on video. The rest are on audio as well. Uh, you can get all those on the Apple podcast. Go over to the Apple podcast. Give it a rating. Uh, I guess that helps. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not I'm not really smart with all that. I just know that I, I do what I'm supposed to do here and God takes the rest of the way. Hey, before we jump into our study today, I want to encourage you to go to jeffkinley.com uh, for a couple of very important things. Number one, make sure you, you're subscribed to my newsletter. I send out one newsletter a week. Uh, it's just an email, okay? And you can, you can delete it if you want to, but I'd love for you to look at it because there's so many resources every single week. In fact, it's basically a whole week of devotions, a whole week of Bible studies uh, that have been basically delivered to your doorstep. So we do that for you um, every week. The second thing is I posted this video on my website uh, regarding the next step in this ministry. And uh, if you're familiar with what's going on in the ministry right now, you know what's happening is that we are, we are in desperate need of studio space. And uh, we are just in the process of waiting on the Lord uh, and based upon how people respond uh, to the need uh, will determine uh, how fast we move down that road. And so we are patiently trusting in God. Uh, we, we have had funds to come in uh, for, to be able to, to lease or to rent uh, some space that we would turn into a studio. Uh, but the greatest need we have right now uh, is, uh, is monthly donations in that. And no donation is too small. I mean, if you want to give $10 a month, you can give $10 a month. Uh, but it just needs to be a regular type of thing so that we can afford to be able to uh, pay the lease on, on some studio space. We've got one kind of marked out, but someone could snatch it up from underneath us. So, uh, But go watch that video. It's just 10 minutes long, I think, and, and you can get a better feel about what's going on and why we're doing this. Uh, it's a really important thing that we move on and continue to pursue excellence and to continue to do everything that we can uh, for the kingdom of God. You know, I was watching a, a video uh, the other day about, about Michael Jordan and about Tiger Woods. And, and you know, regardless about what you think about them as human beings, uh, in terms of their co contribution to their, their respective sports, their mindset was always, I I've got to do more. I've got to do better than I'm currently doing. Every game is important. And whether it's Tiger Woods playing with a bad back or Michael Jordan playing with the flu, they soldiered on and won for their team. And we, we want to do the same thing. We want to take that spirit, uh, but really amplify it through the Holy Spirit and to be able to do great things for God. Uh, because our time on this earth is so short, it's so limited. Why not use our resources, our energies, our spiritual giftedness, our prayers to propel the truth of God into this world uh, before it's too late. So that's what it's all about. So go to jeffkinley.com, check that out. All right, let's get into our study today. We're in Ephesians chapter four, and there's an interesting break here in the book of Ephesians. And, and here's what's going on. For three chapters in this book, Paul has not told us a single thing that we're supposed to do. Um, he's only told us who we are and what God's done for us. Now just pause for a moment and think about that for a second. Think about God's purpose in setting the stage and laying the foundation for our future obedience. God doesn't begin by saying, hey, down there, get it right, get your life together, get in line. He didn't say that. He begins by saying, I want you to know something that I did for you before the world even began. I want you to know something that I've done for you at the moment of salvation. And I want you to know all the things that I've done for you since then that you've been a part of the body of Christ. So he just says, all right, we're going to open up the portfolio, your salvation portfolio, 
And I'm going to explain to you all these amazing blessings that we've been studying in the book of Ephesians. I want, to, I want you to see the benefit package that you get just from believing on Jesus Christ. Now, based on all that, that's chapters one through three. Now he gives us his first command in chapter four. So let's jump into it. We know we go now from uh, from doctrine to devotion. He goes, I therefore, the prisoner uh, of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So the, the one command uh, in these verses that we're studying here is the is the command to walk, to walk. It's the Greek word peripateo, and it simply means to walk about, uh, to, to complete a full circle. Essentially, what he's saying is, let this mark the totality of your life. Walk is a, is a metaphor or a, sy a synonym for living your life. So you, we could translate this in our modern language, uh, live your life in a manner worthy. So when you see walk sometimes in Scripture, it, it refers to that, that peripateo, uh, live your life. So how are we supposed to live? He says, live it in a worthy way. What do you mean by that? Well, he says, worthy of the calling. Well, what's the calling? The calling is the calling you've been given to come and follow Jesus Christ, to come and be his disciple in this world. And, you know, we think back on what Jesus said about discipleship back in like Luke chapter 14, uh, back in Matthew uh, chapter 10, where he called his disciples to him. And he didn't just call them, he didn't call them the life of ease. In fact, nowhere in the Bible does it say, I've called you to be happy. It doesn't say that. Now, there's the byproduct of our obedience, according to John 15, is happiness, a joy rather. But God doesn't call us to be happy. He doesn't call us to easy lives. He doesn't call us to happy lives. But he calls us to, to lives that are that are marked by a, a consistent devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And obviously we're frail creatures. We don't always live up to that. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is our, our power source, our supply, that's how we live this thing. Uh, but he says the, the calling, it's a high calling. It's a high calling that God has given to you and me to bear the name of Christ, to say we are a Christian. Uh, I, I know uh, that when we think about sometimes about where we are sort of in the food chain of the world, you know, we may see ourselves as kind of being down there, you know, near the, near the uh, maybe bottom feeders of the ocean as far as the world is concerned. But God has exalted us. Uh, God has lifted us up. God has put us positionally in a place where we can have influence over others uh, for the kingdom of God. And it's a high calling because he's a holy God. Uh, it's a high calling because he's a God that, that is majestic, that the God that made the world, he's the creator. Uh, we're we're not serving uh, in some you know backwoods farm somewhere. We're serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It, it'd be like this. It'd be like if you were in the um, in the major league draft and um, and you were going to be drafted by a major league baseball team, for example. It's the difference between being drafted by. Uh, let's say a fictional team, the the East Tennessee uh, uh, accountants or something. Nothing against accountants, but it's like you don't. Do you really want to play for the accountants, or are you want to play for the New York Yankees or the Atlanta Braves or the St. Louis Cardinals or the Texas Rangers or someone like that? God's saying, look, you're not on a farm team here somewhere. You're not in Double A ball or Triple A ball. You've been called up to the bigs, as they say. You've been called to the major leagues. You're in the major leagues as a believer spiritually speaking. And so because you serve a great, mighty, wonderful king, he just says, uh, live up to that. I mean, live that way. Live in such a way that when people look at you, they see how worthy your God really is. Uh, they see how, how amazing he is just by the way you, uh, you look, uh, we take care of yourself, obviously, but just by your countenance, uh, by the way you treat other people, by how you talk to other people. Uh, I was having a conversation with a pastor uh, this past week, and and uh, we were having dinner together, and I'd just spoken at his church and just had a great ministry there. And uh, we were just talking about humility, and we're talking about how, you know, sometimes when you are seen by a lot of people, people have certain expectations of you. 
And and I'm aware of that. I'm, I'm trying to be more aware of that uh, because as I travel and go to places, people are coming up to me saying, I watch you all the time. I've listened to you for years. I've read all your books. I can't believe I'm standing here in person with you. Uh, I'm hearing your voice in person. I've listened to you, all this stuff, you know. And, and just so you'll know for the record, I don't get a buzz from that. In other words, my ego doesn't inflate when people say that to me because I realize a couple of things about me. Number one, I know me. I know I'm just a guy. I'm, I'm just a servant. I'm an under rower in the ship, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, my family knows that too. Okay, I'm just a guy. Uh, but also I know I'm very replaceable. And, and so there's no room for pride. There's no room for ego in, the, in ministry or in, on television or in the body of Christ. And, 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 you know, whether you're a pastor of a large church or you've got a ministry that reaches out across the world, you're traveling everywhere, people are wanting your autograph. Who cares in the end? in the sense that it's not about you anyway. And that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying that you need to walk in a manner worthy. And if you're walking in a manner that causes people to think you're all that, then you're not walking worthy. If you walk in a way, if you live your life in a manner that causes people to say, what, a, what an amazing God, what an incredible Bible, uh, what scripture, the scripture's blowing my mind. If you're helping people understand that, then that's part of living in a manner worthy of your calling. But as I was talking to this pastor, I was talking to him about, you know, there are there are certain Christian celebrities out there uh, that that um, it, it's a little bit obvious they've got they've got an ego. They're unapproachable. You can't ever touch them. You know, you can't shake their hand. They won't take a picture with you, whatever it might be. But I just said this to him and maybe this this will communicate. I said, you know, one time my wife said to me years ago when I first started traveling and speaking, she said this. She said, Jeff, how you treat the college intern that picks you up from the airport and how you talk to him on the way to the church says more about you than anything you will ever say from that stage. And I thought, wow, that's, that is, that's wisdom right there. And it's true. It really is true that someone's character uh, comes, comes out by the way they treat people who they perceive don't have anything to give to them. Did you get that? The way you and I treat people who don't have anything to give back to us, uh, those are the people that um, th that God looks at us and goes, "Hey, this is a character test right here." And I and I get I get a lot of those people because most people who who approach me either through email or through uh, speaking in person or or whatever it might be. They're wanting something from me. Now, not selfishly. They're wanting me to minister to them. That's awesome, and I love that. Don't don't get the wrong impression. But they're wanting something from me. They're they're not wanting uh, to give something to me. Typically, they're wanting to 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 receive something from me, and that's what God's called me to do. So that's that's all cool. Um, but treating those people with dignity, treating them as if they're important. You know, if here comes a a former uh, you know, famous football player, they're coming up to my, my book table. I'm going to treat that person more important. Here comes the mayor of the city, like last weekend, who comes up and pins me with this pen from the city. Am I going to treat him with more respect than I do uh, the, the young man with Down syndrome who came up to my book table and wanted to ask me a question about Bible prophecy? You see, when we, when we differentiate like that, then you know what happens? It shows we're not work, walking in a manner worthy. And so it's important for us to just realize that we serve a God who is worthy and, and the way we live our life reflects whether or not we believe that to the rest of the world. I love what Paul says here in verse one. He says, he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. So lest you think that, you know, if you go into ministry, it's all going to be, woohoo, it's going to be, you're going to be rich. Uh, you're going to be taken care of. Uh, everything is going to be great for you. Paul says, I'm in prison. How do you figure that into your into your theology there? So so you know ministry does cost you something. Uh, sometimes it costs you a great deal. Uh, but anyway, Paul says I'm the prisoner. He says and I entreat you. He's almost saying I'm I'm, I'm really imploring you. I'm really begging you guys uh, to walk this way uh, with a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now what what have we been called to? We've been called to salvation. And in the context of this passage here, we've also been called. Uh, to uh, to be united with the body of Christ. So there is, a, in other words, you know, someone once said there are no lone rangers in the Christian life. Uh, and someone said even, even the lone ranger had Tonto as his faithful uh, sidekick. But guess what? We're connected. 
I mean, Paul even says in this letter, he says, we are members of one another. In, in other words, as you and I are climbing up this mountain of life, whether we see it, whether we realize it, whether we want it, whether we think we need it, we are roped in to other believers. We're tied off at the waist, and that rope leads to another uh, believer out there somewhere uh, that we should be connected to. And, and this, is, this is why he says here, uh, in the rest of this passage, uh, he's talking about the uh, the fact that that we have a an intricate connection and relationship with other believers. Now look what he says here uh, in beginning in verse uh, verse two. How, how are we to walk? Well, he says with all humility and gentleness. That's talking about an inward attitude that's portrayed outwardly that people understand that you don't think too highly of yourselves. Or as Paul said in Romans, don't think uh, more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Think of yourself, that's fine. Think of yourself at a certain level, but just don't exalt yourself or elevate yourself at a level above what you what you really are. Don't pretend. Don't be a, they used to call it being poser, you know? Don't be a poser. Don't pose as being something that you're not. At the same time, you don't unnecessarily beat yourself up and say, oh, I'm, I'm nothing. I'm a worm. You know, I, I can't. I, I'm nobody for God. Listen, that's insulting to God because God wants to use you in a great way. So it's thinking of ourselves in a right way, that we are loved by God, accepted by Him. All these things He's been saying in chapters 1 through 3, that ought to make you humble, by the way. If, if you're not humble from reading Ephesians 1, 1 through 14, then yeah, you do have an ego problem. That, that ought to make you so incredibly broken and humble before God. Uh, and, it, and it should have that effect on us. So humility, gentleness. Uh, humility, again, is, 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 means putting Christ first and others, uh, others uh, uh, second and then yourself third. So think about this. When I go to church, when I'm with other believers, uh, how do I put Christ first? How do I put others second? And how do I put myself third? Always think of yourself as third. Gentleness, he says. He says, walk with gentleness. Uh, this refers to the way that we that we uh, uh, are interacting with other people in our lives. A gentle person has the ability to treat other people with tenderness and, and with kindness. And as much as it depends upon us, as much as we are able, humanly speaking, uh, we should be tender with each other. Be gentle. We don't have to be harsh. You know, so, some people, uh, you know, some people, they're, they're just like trying to hug a porcupine, you know, <laughs> like they're just really hard to love because they send off those vibes that they're just real edgy and sharp and, and, and they're not warm and they won't let you in. Hey, be kind to them. Just be be gentle uh, with, especially those in, in, the, in the body of Christ. Then he says, walk with patience. And, and the patience here, I think, uh, refers to the ability uh, to uh, to endure difficulties and discomfort with other people without fighting back. And, you know, there's a tendency we all have, we always we want to correct other people all the time. And, uh, and God says, look, look, be patient. Don't, don't try to rush God's work in their life. God loves them more than you do. God's concerned about them more than you're concerned. And God's upset with them more than you're upset with them about something. But it's the idea of patience, of long suffering, of enduring uh, in people's relationships. And, you know, some people are just not, they're not as easy to love. Let's be honest. Uh, but God says, be patient with them. I love what uh, Billy Graham's wife uh, used to say a lot. She used to say, uh, please be patient with me. God's not finished with me yet. And she would go on to explain that, that I am a Christian that is under construction. I'm, I'm under construction. And, uh, and at the end of her life, when she died on her tombstone, if I'm not mistaken, this is true, you can check it out, is that it just says construction finished or construction complete. You know, she is complete now. And it's just the idea that we're all in process. We're all on this journey. You, you know, you don't criticize and get on the freshman like you would the senior. You don't criticize the one that is a that is a novice in the Christian life or a novice on the team. Uh, they they're just learning this whole thing, uh, like you would be with someone who's been been at it for a long time. Hey man, you know, get your game in order. You know, uh, you need to help these people. Uh, I went to my 
grandson's baseball game the other night. I love watching him develop in baseball. And I've been helping him with his swing and, and with his eye-hand coordination, things like that. But you look out in the field and, you know, you got these little kids out there, you know, six, seven years old. They're out there catching butterflies in left field. And, you know, they're just holding the bat, looking at the bat. Then they see their grandparents in the stands. They're, hey, hey grandma. You know, it's like you don't expect enough uh, that much from them. But you know what? In two years, three years, four years, when they get to high school, if they're out in the in left field catching butterflies, you need to get in the dugout, boy. You know, you need to get your game game face on, get your hat on, and get out there and play ball. You know, and, and that's the way it is with believers. You know, we have to be patient with with each other as God is constructing the character and image of Christ in that person. Because guess what? He's doing the same thing in us. I am a person that is still. Uh, under construction. I'm a person that is still in process. And, and as I was sharing with uh, my, my friend, my pastor, uh, the friend that I was at his church the other day, I said, you know what? I'm still learning so much. It's like I, I've got a stack of books. I'm not kidding. A stack of books this tall on my this, this tall on my desk uh, that I'm just dying to read. I'm dying to learn from. Why? Because I realize that, that I'm not there. I need to continue to grow. So part of that Patience is, is where we exercise that patience uh, with each other. And then he says here, he says, showing forbearance to one another in love. And um, and this is uh, the, the idea of, uh, of, of love is patient. That's what 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says. And so this, this ties in uh, with what he's saying here with patience is that uh, forbearance just simply means that I, I'm going to I'm going to cut you some slack, okay? I'm going to be kind to you. I'm going to love you. Any, I'm going to love you through your awkwardness. I mean, think about, you know, kids when they go through puberty, you know, and their voice cracks and you know, they're, they're gangly and lanky and they don't walk right and they trip and all this stuff, you know. It's like forbear with them in love. I mean, be patient with them. Hang in there with them. Stick with them is what he's saying. And what he's saying here is stick with the body of Christ. Stick with your brothers and sisters, even though they may go through some some awkward phases in their life. And then he says in, in verse four, uh, this, uh, excuse me, verse three, and this is all a part of what it means to walk worthy. He says, being diligent, that means working hard at something, to preserve the unity of the spirit uh, in the bond of peace. To preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, why does he say that? Well, Paul understands couple things. He understands human nature. He understands that we have an enemy. And we, he understands the fact that that groups of people don't just naturally stay cohesive, that they tend, because of the selfishness of the human heart, uh, to dissolve, to, to have factions, to go off on, on different you know tangents and to become disconnected from one another, uh, that type of thing. And that, so he says, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Now, the unity of the Spirit does not mean that we all put all of our, uh, we, we put all of our doctrinal differences aside or, or that we don't, or that we say doctrine doesn't matter, truth doesn't matter. It's just that we're unified. Well, the point is unified around what though? See, unity, and we talked about this when we studied John 17 together, is that uh, in the high priestly prayer of Christ there, is that unity is not something that, that means that we all look the same. OK, uh, we have diversity in our unity. But secondly, it also doesn't mean that, that we simply just say we declare ourselves to be one without really being, without experiencing that unity. And unity has no meaning unless there is something around which you are unified. You say, well, Jeff, we're, we're unified around Jesus. Really? Which Jesus? The Jesus that people are making up in the world today and in the church? Or the Jesus we find in the Bible, because there's only one Jesus, and there's only one description of Him uh, overall and uh, comprehensively in the Bible. So when we say we're united around Jesus, that means we're united around who He said He was, who the Gospels say He is, who Paul says He is, and we're united around the rest of the New Testament and the Word of God. You know why? Because Jesus not only validated the Old Testament, but the Holy Spirit came and inspired these apostolic writers to write the New Testament. So when you say preserve the unity of the Spirit, it's the unity that the Spirit is inspiring. And what did the Spirit inspire? He inspired the Scriptures. He inspired the knowledge that you and I have about Jesus and about God and about the attributes of God and, and who Christ is and what he did on the cross and what that meant and the resurrection and its impact on our lives. And, 
and theology, which is what we've been studying here in, in Ephesians. So when you say the unity of the Spirit, it presupposes that the whole church is coming together. They're rallying around a common truth, common truth, and that truth doesn't change. And so uh, this is one reason why, uh, you know, you see churches that that apostatize. In other words, they, they stand away from the truth. And the reason that happens is because they're not committed uh, to preserve the unity of the spirit that's found in the word of God. And I mean, you go to the book, books of first and second Timothy, and Paul just goes on and on and on to Timothy about Timothy guard, you know, preserve, watch over what? the truth because people are going to want to pick apart the truth you know like playing that that game jenga you know they want to pull out parts of the truth but when you do that eventually the tower is going to fall and so you and i have to uh, to work hard at preserving the you know how do we do that how do we do that well we do that by uh, by being at peace with one another it says it says uh, preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and we're gonna we'll talk about more next week about more about what this piece actually uh, uh, actually looks like and how he describes it, uh, but but here he's talking about that when we are unified, uh, we have peace with one another. Uh, this is one of the one of the um, the solutions, if you will, to uh, to conflict in the church, to disunity in the church, is that everybody needs to be called back to the same thing. So you may have an idea, someone else has an idea over here, but God has the only real idea. God has the only real truth. So if we, if we rally around the truth of God, then we're all believing in the same thing, and that is unity. And, and when we believe uh, in the truth, then our emotions eventually follow that. And Because this is the way God designed you and me. He designed us to think and to believe. And then based upon the thinking and the believing, the pattern and the habits of thinking and believing, do you know what happens next? Those emotions go, oh, the train's leaving the station and they jump on. And the emotions come become the caboose of our lives. If you try to lead your life by emotions, then guess what? You're not going to walk in a manner worthy. You're not going to be patient. You're not going to be humble. not going to be gentle. not going to have forbearance. not going to have unity. But if you live your life based upon the truth that God has revealed, then your emotions eventually will come on board. Now, if, if there's a disconnect in your emotions and you've been studying the word and following God and obeying him just by raw faith for years and your emotions have never caught on, my friend, something's happening. Something, there is a, a serious problem uh, in your life because eventually emotions will get on board. Now, it doesn't mean we won't have doubts, won't sometimes feel angry or depressed or or, or more excited than we should be, or whatever. Our emotions can can uh, can sometimes be the the tail that wags the dog. Unfortunately, uh, but God wants us to make sure that that the truth and our belief in that truth is what leads the train, and then the emotions come behind us at the end. Well, we'll pick up in verse four next week and talk more about this unity and and some cool things around which we are unified. And finally, go to jeffkinley.com. Hey, watch that video. Tell me what you think. Tell me your thoughts. And tell me that you're praying uh, for this endeavor that we're seeking. God bless you. I'll see you next time.